All right. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Travis here with BikeBandit.com for a new segment we're going to be doing called Live Sessions. Uh, Live Sessions is a show where we're going to go around, talk to some of the different companies within the industry, uh, big players, fun stuff like that, get some good stories, insights, learn about products and uh, all things about motorcycles that we love. <clears throat> uh, tonight's guest is going to be Dave Woolman from Motul USA. So uh, let's go ahead and welcome Dave to the show. How are we doing there, man? You hear me all right? Yeah. Hello, everybody. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Welcome. Happy to have you here uh, joining us for our very first episode. Well, it's one of uh, it's also a first for us to have it in this uh, this format. So uh, I, I think it's wonderful. I'm very happy that you guys joined us. Thank you very much, man. Happy to have you. Um, so let's go through and do a quick rundown about who exactly Dave Woolman is and uh, how long you've been with Motul, how you got with Motul, and uh, kind of what your position there is and what led you to where you're at today with the company. Well, that's a lot of uh, questions. <laughs> <laughs> Off one at a time. <clears throat> yeah, so... Um... My history dates uh, back to 1981, where I actually uh, worked for Yoshimura R&D. So I was a machinist, mechanic, fabricator, welding, that type of uh, background. Um, so uh, we decided that, uh, you know, as development goes, as time goes on, uh, our our mother company was in Japan, Yoshimura, okay. uh, Japan, and they were sponsored by, Mo and we decided that uh, it was uh, up to us uh, if we could uh, ask to also be sponsored by Motul. And uh, we just heard good things about it. So we said, okay. So we sent a message over and then we got a note back that says uh, that they would be interested. And so uh, shall we say after some negotiations in 1986, Motul Yoshimura became uh, a uh, partnership, and Mo Yoshimura became the first importers of uh, Motul products in the United States, and so that that started in 1986. So basically, um, you reaching out to Motul set up the whole groundwork for bringing Motul into the USA. Well, it uh, since we have uh, Nabi, uh, so here Watt and Nabi, uh, and he he was the. Uh, Vice president at that time got direct call to Japan, and then then it went to France. Okay. And then we had some negotiations with uh, Mr. Amelo and uh, Mr. June and Mr. Zog, which are the uh, you know they're the top three players uh, at the time in 1985, and we uh, uh, came to an agreement. And uh, Motul was in the United States in 1986. Uh, and of course, uh, history-wise, we're 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 still here. <laughs> um, actually, though, in 1989, uh, Motul uh, decided that they would actually create a corporation. So Motul USA was born in 1989. Really? Uh, okay. <clears throat> and so it became its own entity with its own officers, its own staff, and it was run out of uh, Yoshimura's warehouse and. Uh, and some employees until until there was enough sales to move completely out, have our own warehouse, et cetera. So I, I was at Yoshimura from 1981 to 1990. Mm -hmm. Took a little bit of a break and started working with Motul in uh, 91. So you kind of brought it over to the U.S., but weren't on board with them when they started the U.S. company, but then transferred over there a couple of years after they got set up? Well, no, actually... Um, I was helping, I helped them get incorporated, and then I helped uh, as far as setting up a computer uh, and setting up some policies, and then uh, I helped them ever since uh, the start of this uh, incorporation. It's just that uh, I wasn't an employee, but I was there since day one. Very cool. Um, so... How many years is that? I'm really bad at math. I mean, that's what, Ooh. 63, 64 years you've been at Motul now? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I feel more like 80, but uh, 80. no. Um, well, let's say in, on the books, 92. So that's a long time. <laughs> that is a, quite a haul right there. So what's your position with Motul now besides guys well, on so YouTube I, videos with us? 
I, uh, I'm a direct, the director of uh, Center of Excellence in, uh, for power sports, meaning that uh, I actually uh, work with our other BUs. So we work with Mexico, Brazil, uh, Colombia, U.S. Uh, so we have uh, 15 so countries. And the idea is to make sure they're practicing, uh, shall we say, best practices, uh, using the right logo, using the right image, no, inex you know, nothing that would tarnish. And then also spreading best practices, you know, like we do here with our new uh, trade uh, manager, Ryan, who set this up um, <clears throat> with uh, our, our uh, people that uh, – are local. <laughs> All right. But, but, so we do 15, you know, I, I, I transmit to 15 countries and then try, we all try to share to be one family, but every market's different. So right, that's right. the idea is what we learn in one place, we, we do in another. I like it. So you're kind of just the, the God that oversees everything there and make sure the brand has a good image across the world and everybody's on the same page as far as how to promote the brand and display it. Well, that's in the Americas. Uh, actually, we have, a, we have a COE Global, so we have eight or nine members that take care of different regions in the world. But okay. that, that's to make sure that power sports, you know, right labeling, right verbiage, right type of application, right product, and then weed out stuff that's no longer... I mean, it just doesn't fit the markets or something like this. Makes sense. All right. Well, that is pretty interesting way to get a different company into the U.S. and up and running right there. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, let's go into what we're going to talk about today. Um, we kind of started and we put some feelers out there about what people wanted to talk about. And I know what Chain Lube is. I've used Chain Lube forever. I've been riding dirt bikes my whole life. But I really have no clue what the difference is between different types of chain lube. So in today's questioning, we are basically wanted to kind of go through and talk about different types of chain lube and when to use a cleaner versus a chain lube that's made for road racing versus off-road and what the differences in those types of products are and what separates one from another. So I think you got a few of them set up there in front of you. If you can kind of give us a rundown of the different products and uh, – What's the what the difference is with them? So, uh, what I'll do is is I'll explain uh, quickly uh, the product development stages. So when I when okay. I first joined Motul, uh, you know, eighty five, eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight, they had one chain lube and it was called Motul Chain or what we call Chain Lube uh, Off Road. Okay. And uh, that uh, was fine for off-road general use, uh, maybe uh, recreational street riding. I mean, it did the job. Uh, and then one, uh, one faithful day at Daytona, uh, help tuning with uh, John K uh, Kaczynski on the Viceroy 250 GP bike. Uh, Back in the two-stroke road race days? Yeah. So I can't remember exactly what year, but I think it was uh, ooh, 94 or something, 95. Um, and uh, the mechanic went and put the chain lube on the chain and, and prepped the bike. And then John Kaczynski was, uh, you know, riding around Daytona. And he took off and came back with uh, this beautiful yellow stripe across his white boot which didn't please anybody. <laughs> so it actually was, uh, was quite the uh, uh, excitement in the paddock because we, we put a, a yellow stripe across his boot. And that was because the speeds were way too, too great at, uh, in Daytona. It's an it's a, it's a open track, right? And it's got banks and it's, it's as fast as you can go type of deal. Yeah. And so uh, that, uh, the next day after screaming and hollering was done, um, <laughs> Uh, I set uh, off a message that we needed to develop a more racing type of product uh, and a street type of product. So <clears throat> that led into uh, the Chain Lube Road. So first thing you can imagine is like, I want it clear. <laughs> I don't want any more yellow in it. Uh, right. 
Then the second thing was that the tactifier needed to be a high-level tactifier, meaning that how are we going to keep the chain lube on the chain at 180 miles an hour, right? So there, there's some big differences there. And then, uh, of course, you know, it has to be heat stable. It has to be able to, because uh, 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 you can't grab a motorcycle chain at Daytona. Uh, I mean, you can just tell the team, why don't you change the gearing so that it's not spinning as fast? Yeah, there you go. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. like an easy way to fix it. Yeah, you know, just slow down. The chain lube won't, yeah. won't fly off. But Perfect. Yeah, that didn't work very much. So, so we ended up making the chain lube road, and the chain lube road has a very uh, strong tactifier, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a sec. Okay. Uh, and then extreme pressure additives, and then, of course, it has to have a strong anti-corrosion and anti-rust. And so, um, of course, the next thing is that, okay, we need something that's going to give us a little more uh, of a racing uh, let's say, uh, uh, application. So, mm -hmm. so the racing chain lube uh, actually has a little white in it, <clears throat> which is a boron technology and other friction modifiers. So uh, to, to go through the line, the first thing, let's say, is that why are we going to do a chain maintenance? And, and the first thing that you've got to remember is that with modern chains that have O-rings, X-rings, Z-rings, etc., mm -hmm. the grease is already inside of the pin. So the idea now is that we have to cut down on corrosion. We have to cut down on rust. Uh, we have to keep the O-rings, Z-rings, X-rings. They need to be supple, right? I mean, right. We, we've got to make sure that they don't get super soft. But then we can't let them get hard and crack. And so uh, you really want to make sure that we have uh, the right chemistry to keep the rust, to keep the corrosion, et cetera, and not affect the O-rings. So within the line, uh, <clears throat> we had to come up with a street version, a racing version, and an, an off-road version for low speeds, going through the woods, trial riding, uh, general so, slow speed, if that makes sense. So we have off-road, very light tactifier. And then we have racing with a slightly tackier tactifier. And then road, which is very, uh, shall we say, uh, very strong tactifier. Because and people we, don't maintenance their bikes as much or what? Well, let me, uh, application. Let me, let me demonstrate uh, what I'm talking about. So okay. this is the chain lube road. And so the chain lube road, uh, sorry, chain lube off-road. All right. Um, right. So it comes out, it's very, very light. So this has a propellant. Okay. And you have a solvent, right? Then you have oil. And then you have the carriers. That, that's the whole line of, of things that are inside. And as you as you apply it, you know it, it goes on as a as a solvent, uh, and it cleans and it and it starts to wet. And then what happens is that you have a low level tectifier. So if you if if you listen, it you can hear that it's tacky, but right. it's not it's so, so aggressive, aggressive, right? It's right. not so it's that. So and so this, this, this is this for is, more of motocross. Could you imagine if you go into a, a sand pit? And, and the idea is that you need to uh, make sure that the chain lube is thin enough that under centrifugal force, the sand goes away from the O-rings, right? Could you right. imagine if you're going, if, if, if you have something super, super tacky, then it, it can turn into a lapping compound. So you got to make sure that the application's correct. So off-road, uh, in the forest, in trails, in trial runs, I mean, low speeds, then regular standard riding. Uh, this this off-road is, uh, is perfect. Um, okay. And so uh, in product development, then we got into the racing one. And this application would be also road or... I mean, you go take a dirt bike in the, into Mexico or Baja or whatever. I mean, you're going fast. So uh, you might go and say, okay, I can use the racing off-road and on-road. But if we look and, you know, we put some on, you can start to hear that this tactic. doesn't release as easily, yeah. 
So this one, this one has got boron technology. That's to help the uh, pin peel off of the sprocket. So we get about one horsepower more uh, on our uh, dyno run. Uh, I mean, I can't say how long you keep that one horsepower, but it right. has friction modifiers, et cetera, and conditioners. But you can hear that the tack is tacky enough to where it remains from flinging, right? Yeah, and then what happens is, this is great for racing off-road, on-road, but if you really want to do uh, fast uh, road use and uh, very high speeds and you're going into water and you're going into a long ride, 1,000 miles, you need something that's going to be, one, clear, so if it does fling off, you don't make a mess everywhere. And then two, uh, conditioner, rust, anti-corrosion, etc. But you want the tactifier to be really strong so it can last on a road bike, especially at high speeds and long distance. And right, so right. to demonstrate that, this is the chain loop of road, um, we sprayed some on this, and this is... Sounds the most tacky. Yes. So this is... Um, you know, once you put it on, you, you spray it on and you do something else. Go, go clean the front, go do this. Don't, do, you know, don't spray it and then right away ride. Uh, okay. you, you need to let, so you have a propellant, right? Then you have a carrier and then you have solvents and all of these need to do their job. They need to clean, they need to, to, to uh, condition and then they need to dry so that you can achieve this and then it does what it's supposed to do <laughs> so now on the road chain lube right there you're saying to apply it and then wait a while before you actually go ride what are you thinking time wise is this five minutes or is this like closer to an hour oh no yeah hey, uh, five five minutes i mean so if i take this right and i and i apply Okay, obviously you're going to apply more than that, but <laughs> hopefully, you know, otherwise that so, can last for years. <laughs> so one of the things that it didn't. So right now this chain lube has a solvent in it, right? So if you're if you're re oiling your chain and you don't have time to do a proper cleaning, you can see that okay that tackiness is gone. The solvent inside itself is is cleaning off the old, uh, laying down another barrier of tactifier, but. Um, it, you know, it tacks up within. Yes, it sounds like it's getting there already. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, five minutes is good. It's just, we got people, they spray the thing and off they go. And then the chain lube is still wet. <laughs> so it's One of my fly friends off. likes me to spray the chain lube on his bike as he's heading onto the track. <laughs> there you go. Like, I mean, this half the stuff ends up on Josh's boot or something. It's kind of weird, <laughs> but he's a odd guy also. Right. Now this, the, we make chain clean, and chain clean is a very special detergent uh, solvent. Uh, we did a lot of testing. Th this needs to be, uh, you know, safe for the O-ring and the Z-ring and the X-rings. It needs to be uh, uh, safe so that one, it doesn't make it too soft. Uh, two, it it doesn't cause them uh, any type of uh, expansion. You know, you can't have the O-rings expand. Um, and so these these type of uh, solvents are, are uh, shall we say, you know, you, after years of development, you, you find the right stuff that's neutral. So the difference is that yeah, we have a solvent in, in the chain loops that will clean its own, but uh, do a proper job with the chain clean. You know, like are you use an apparatus like this uh, uh, Moto Chain Mate or so where. You can really get the grime out. You can get all of the stuff around the O-rings out. You can, you know, you do a proper cleaning, and then re reapplying the, the chain lube is now all fresh without little pebbles and dust and dirt and stuff. So a proper cleaning Correct. is a necessity. <clears throat> so, so does that have some sort of foam or agent that gets in there and pushes debris out, or does it just kind of break everything down and then you need to wipe it off with a brush or something? Right. So, uh, we, you know, like, for instance, we have this off-road chain care kit and we have this road chain care kit. And, mm -hmm. and exactly is that we have uh, inside is a chain lube and then the chain clean and then a, a proper chain brush. Okay. And so 
yeah, you, you, you need to brush it. Uh, you know, it's like a, it's like brushing your teeth, right? You know, I've done that before. You got to get all that crud off of there. <laughs> and I washed my hands once this week. It's good. Yeah, well, at least once. You can use a solvent. You know that that'll clean them. I didn't say um, what I washed them with. <laughs> so the other thing that's kind of interesting is that this is proper chain clean. Um, you, these three different applications, right? Very, very light tack, medium tack with some uh, friction modifiers and extreme pressure additives, and then the road, which is extreme pressure clear uh, solvent conditioner, anti rust. We also made a chain paste. Okay. And so the chain paste, uh, you know, it. it it is a compromise. It works well off road. Works well on road. It's. It is not. Um, uh, you know, it's not going to be the best for all application. But you know, un anticipating that in the near future, uh, especially in California, right? So, what's going to happen in the near future when CARB or somebody says, you know <laughs> what, we. Uh. You know, you you you're polluting, so we need you to uh, uh, stop using uh, aerosols for uh, chain loop uh, because well, you're you're killing the planet. So we made a chain paste, and we're like five years ahead of everybody else because mm -hmm. well, uh, we want to make sure that we're prepared for the future. And Hopefully not watching. This, and this is the future if, if indeed we, uh, we run into a situation where the chain lube, uh, uh, the VOCs and the chain lube uh, laws become too tight and you can't have a propellant and solvent without having volatile organic chemicals, <laughs> things that evaporate, right? So, you know, you can't get it to come out really liquidy and solvent. And have a low VOC. <laughs> right, right. It doesn't work. That day anyway, comes, so. I'll be going to Arizona to lube my chain every time and stop yeah. on stuff. Um, so actually, I've had a couple of questions come across. Um, Dude. Let's go to the first one from uh, YouTube from Kyle Bradshaw. Maybe uh, producer Matt, if you can drag that on the screen right there. So Kyle asks, so for the adventure bike guy doing, say, 100 miles an hour down the freeway, he jumps off the road at that point, goes into the dunes and the dirt. Do you guys recommend like a road or an off-road style chain lube? I'd go with the racing one. It's in between. Okay, so it's not as tacky as the full uh, yep. road. Yeah. So, okay. Exactly. I mean, it's a dual-purpose bike, and I said that the racing one can do both because it's lightly tacky, and it also has friction modifiers, so... If he's going 100 miles an hour down the freeway, he's a road guy. And if he's going off road, he is. I, I actually know this guy, and he's definitely a road princess. Yes, yeah, so, right, a road guy. Yeah, so I would say that the uh, the chain loop factory line would be the best bet because it's it's not so so light. So the chain loop off road will fling off at 100 mile an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I that already happened to us 25 years ago. <laughs> um, so I would say the middle one. I would say that uh, the racing one is going to be just fine for him. Sounds like he's racing anyways, 100 mile now on a street. He's probably just late to work or something. <laughs> uh, okay. And then I had one other question. Um, Matt, if you can scroll back down. Or there it is. Uh, from Ivan Esteban on Facebook. Uh, he was asking about having the chain being warm or cold when applying a product if it actually makes a difference at all, um, if you want to do it in between sessions, say you're at the at the at the track doing some road racing stuff, or if it should be colder or a little warmer, if that makes a difference on how it's applied. Um, you know, war warm is always better for 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 cleaning and this, but you're going to spray solvent and cleaner on it. You're cooling the chain down really quick, so. Right. Um, uh, and you're using a solvent, so I would say that. If it's at if it's at a track or something, the chain is never really freezing because you're always trying to keep things moving. But mm -hmm. uh, you certainly can't do it right at Daytona right off of a practice because the chain is like 300 degrees. Yeah. I, I would say that that it's not super critical because you're still spraying the solvent, you're still applying a, a cleaner, and it's going to work 
with all ranges of temperature. All right. Makes sense. And then I have a question myself that kind of popped up in my head. Um, when I'm going through, I'm prepping my bike, I'm cleaning it after a weekend out of riding, something like that. I come home, wash my bike, and I'm going to put it in my garage. I usually lube my chain before I put it away, especially if I've been hitting it with a pressure washer or a hose. Yes. What are your thoughts on doing chain prep and then putting the bike away and then letting it sit for a few days and then going riding? Should I reapply chain lube right before I go ride once again for off-road no. or should it be fine? No, you're fine. Um, you said you're going to clean it, then then service the chain, then park it. So I, then it sounds like more steps than I usually take, but that sounds like the right way to do it. <laughs> well, I mean, the tactifier, the whole job of the tactifier is to keep it on the chain. So right. you're not going to come into the garage two days later and find this puddle on the on the on the cement because the uh, the tactifiers have have, have take, done their job and right. the chain is still on the chain. Uh, the spray is still on the chain. I was just wondering if things break down over time or whatever. So that makes makes sense right there, though. Um, now, is there a benefit to doing it a day ahead of time and letting it have more time to set? Or does it not really matter? Say, let's talk about the off-road specifically. Um, is there a difference in how well it's going to tack up to the chain if you do it right before you go ride, say, a couple minutes before versus the night before? Uh, no, it, it, the night before is better as far as your mental, because you just know you can <laughs> load the truck and go. Uh, Something else will come up, trust me. Yeah, so uh, it's not going it, to, I mean, while you're at the, let's say the event or you're at the uh, uh, camping site or whatever, if you have to spray it uh, and maintenance before you go riding, like I said, you need to wait a few minutes for the tactifier and the solvents to go away and the tactifier to, to tack up. It doesn't matter if you do it uh, 10 minutes before you go ride or the night before, because once it tacks up, it's not going to keep getting tackier and tackier. You okay. know what I mean? Yeah, it'll reach that spot where it's good to go. And Well, it, you know, it's like this. I sprayed, la I sprayed Tuesday, and, uh, and you know, the tack is, is still very light. Yeah. And uh, it's so, no, it, the tactifier will reach a certain tactif tack, <laughs> and then <Tactification>. it's it. <laughs> All right. That's good. Uh, and then let's get into chain cleaning. Um, so we can talk off-road first and then on-road. How often do you recommend someone actually go through and more so than just reapplying lubricant? How often do you recommend someone goes through and cleans the chain, uses the brush on it? Uh, something like that. You know, it really depends on 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 the app at, at hand. Meaning that if it's me, I don't ride so fast. I'm not. Uh, I might get stuck. You know, but uh, <laughs> it, it, as compared to let's say Ryan or you or or whoever else that's uh, that that has the throttle wide open and they're going everywhere, they're abusing it much more. So the rider that is going to be aggressive and he's got, you know, he's, he's got mud and dirt and everything flying. He's going to have to clean and reapply more often. But um, I would say that uh, it, it, the weekend is fine, right? Okay. Not to clean your chain every night, you know, reapplying the chain lube is, is, is shall we say the solvent will clean enough. If, okay. if you have time, I'd clean it after you know an outing but i'm considering the weekend let's say or or the five days out i might clean it on the third day if i'm going through a bunch of mud and crap but i mean if You're it's relatively much, much better on chain stuff than me i'm like ah, 50 70 hours time to scrub it down and clean it and not just apply the chain yeah over, so well, you can, but if, if you, you, you'll you notice, you just look at the chain, and if it's starting to be crusty and a little brown color stuff coming around, you might want to clean it. <laughs> Maybe. I think I, I might have to go do that right now, actually. <laughs> actually, you know what? I got a brand new bike in the garage I haven't even started yet, so the chain is in perfect condition. Yes. Um, uh, we also, uh, you know, what's interesting is that we also have, I put the Shine and Go out, it's slightly different than uh, chain loop. But on the other hand, um, this product was uh, developed 
for two specific reasons. One is to keep the Georgia clay from sticking under wheels, chassis, etc. And the second was that it can it can clean uh, different, uh, let's say, uh, road grime or uh, chain grime. Uh, and so it, it does two purposes. One is it makes plastic very pretty, and, and that's nice. That's why it's kind of gold, shine and go. But the, the core value of this product is that uh, it's a nonstick spray that leaves a uh, – you can't barely see uh, the uh, anti-corrosion coat it leaves, but it put, puts down such a nonstick surface that if you spray your bike, you clean it all down, and you put a sticker kit on, you go for one ride, the sticker kit <laughs> flies right off. You know? So uh, another thing that it's it's very good for is that you know, let's say you're cleaning your bike and you find that uh, you've got some chain lube that's on the wheel or it's on the rim, etc. So you know, if you this still has some tack, so you know a little a little tiny spritz. Let's say you do the wheel, and that shine and go you just sprayed on there. Yeah, this this okay. shine and go right. So, as a nonstick spray, you know you wait one sec, and you'll see that there is absolutely no chain loop whatsoever. It's completely clean. It's dry. So. Huh. That was on the off-road, which is, you know, is the lightest tack. And then <clears throat> now we have the racing, which is a little more tacky. But if we take a little bit of the shine and go, and let's say that's on your wheel, you let it sit for, again, I don't know, 10 seconds? Sounds like a good amount of time. And then you wipe it off, and again, right? That's yeah, good to go there. Yeah. It's, it's so. Uh, I've it's actually absolutely been clean, right? There's no, there's no sticky stuff left. Right. And the last is that now we know this is, right? This is this the is most really, tacky. By the way, uh, this is heat sensitive. So as the chain gets really hot, this tack will be lighter and lighter. So it's not robbing horsepower. So it's kind of temperature uh, sensitive, which, which. Like all oils, you know, they'll they'll lighten up a bit when they get hot. So if we spray this chain lube road, which is super tacky with the shine and go, <clears throat> let it sit again, and you can see now that absolutely nothing. It's just for the product I love right there. I've been using that stuff on my bike for years. I mean, I call That's it new bike in a can essentially. Spray yep. it on there, let it sit. If we're going out to go ride somewhere muddy and nasty, I just douse my bike in the stuff. That way when I come home, hit it with the pressure washer, and it just falls right off. Otherwise, sometimes Utah, Arizona, you get those weird red clays, yep. and the stuff just builds up on your bike. It's nasty. Yes, that was – it's funny, but the true story of uh, – uh, it was really perfected with uh, Mike LaRocco's dad. Really? Uh, yes, because I was uh, – we were sponsoring them with that 95. We were the factory Kawasaki team sponsor. So uh, he called and said, okay, I'm having problems with the water in the swing arm pivot, steering head bearings, the electronics, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, well, what are you calling me? But you need to turn down the pressure washer. And he says, yeah, <laughs> but I can't get the Georgia clay off. So this is Kawasaki factory. I'm not putting a dirty bike on the start line. It's like, oh, right. okay. So hence there was – you know, if we're talking about uh, product development, here was an application, a challenge, right? Here's a pro racer and a pro mechanic going, okay, chemical guy, fix it. Make it so that it works. And and that's where this product development and product came from is that, yes, yeah, it makes it pretty and all that other stuff, but it's got a function. And that's that's to clean stuff off that gets where it shouldn't be and then prevent stuff from sticking so you know you got the drag racer and he does it under the fender so that the tire rubber doesn't yep. stick everything stuff. just drops off you can walk by a fender and just smack it with your hand really quick and everything <laughs> just drops out of there now the, the thing is that it's dry so there's other products out there that leave kind of a coating that actually attracts dust and dirt right um, we wanted it absolutely dry so that it's not it doesn't it attract the dust and dirt but if you try to put a sticker on there it'll just it'll pop oh, off I, 
I've done that so many times where I prep my bike to go out to like a sprint enduro or something. And then I pull up and I get my numbers and I forget to wipe it off. And I go to put my number plate on <laughs> my bike and it just slides. And I'm just like, ah, oh, I just ruined the damn thing. So I'm cleaning it and windexing it. I find that works pretty good. Yeah. And yeah, anyway, um, another question though, uh, Garrett Ortiz asked from Facebook right now. Um, he said he uses the Motul chain cleaner as a grime remover or degreaser across the whole bike. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any surfaces he should not use that on? Do you think it's going to hurt the bike at all? Should he maybe use the shining go? What do you think is about using chain cleaner as a, just a general degreaser on a motorcycle? Well, yeah. You know, the shining go with some tacky uh, gluey stuff is 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 a is a quick clean right um the, this this solvent um should not hurt anything as far as paint or uh or engine color or any of that so okay. i'm not worried that if he uses it all over the place uh, that it's going to be uh uh, a problem. Uh, I wouldn't use it like on a on a gloss painted gas tank or something. You know, we have we have washing wax for that. What about on a beta motorcycle? I know they're a little different. No betas, no problem. Okay, they're fine. Just spray. Uh, I mean, uh, we even have a contact cleaner now that uh, uh, is 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 safe and uh, it doesn't hurt soft plastics. Because really? we used to have some pretty aggressive stuff, you know. Overspray would ruin the soft plastic. So we oh yeah, the white spots and make them brittle and stuff like that. Yes, yes. So no, I mean this is a pretty sol safe, soft solvent. Um, he won't have too much trouble using it on the engine and stuff. But if you if he's gonna put it on painted surfaces or something, I would use something else. <laughs> All right. Um, got another question from Scott S on uh. YouTube popping up right here. And he says, after using chain cleaner and scrubbing it, he washes it off with water from a hose. He doesn't use a pressure. It's just more of a light rinse. Will the chain lube displace the water that's in the chain? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, that's why we the, picked it. Yeah, the solvent, the solvent, uh, the solvent conditioners will, uh, uh, will get under it. Um, but if he, if you already clean the chain with the solvent and, and, and then wash it down, let it dry, then chain, then put the chain loop. I, I don't think you'll have a problem because okay. the solvent will try to get underneath it. But well, why does he wash it? Why does he wash it with soap and water after he cleans the chain with the chain clean? I'm thinking he washed his bike and then, or he cleaned his chain, washed his bike, cleaned the chain. I don't know. Just <laughs> questions coming from online. So, I'm so, some, some people, I mean, but some people do that because they're they're thinking that the solvent, the cleaner, will be aggressive, and it will eat it will eat something if he doesn't wash it. But you don't have to worry about it because okay. the solvent isn't, you know, like it's not going to do any damage if you leave it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, and. Got another question from Keith J over on uh, YouTube here, and it doesn't say if it's for off road or on route, but it says which chain loop for rainy weather street use. I guess it does say street use. Last line right there. Yeah, um, the chain loop road is 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 perfect because one of the things of it being really tacky. I mean, you're not going to heat the chain up super hot, but then it puts down a, a tough layer so that the water doesn't get in between uh, the O rings. Uh, you know, because there's the object or the idea is to make sure that we don't allow the grease to come out of the O-rings. So you need to keep them supple. If he's riding in the rain, Chain Loop Road, once it's applied, won't let the water get into uh, underneath the uh, the O-ring. Okay, that makes sense. Kind of creates a heavier barrier. Yes, exactly. And then centrifugal force will pull the water away anyways. We hope. <laughs> oh, so let's see what else we got here. I got a couple more questions. Uh, let's see. Kind of scrolling through a couple things here. Um, 
Now, earlier when we were talking before we went live, you showed me some sort of chain cleaning. Uh, I don't know if it was a machine or some uh. sort of. What was that thing? I mean, is that worth talking about, or is that not a Motul product? Well, no, the guy recommends Motul. All right, that's a good thing for him to do. We can give him a little plug. Well, I mean, it's just we uh, we keep it uh, uh, we keep a, a, let's say a, uh, a partnership, or we work together. But this uh, this apparatus is made ah so. This apparatus is made so that uh, these, these these arms are adjustable, so you can bring it up to. Uh, uh, and what is this called? It's a Moto chain mate. So this thing is adjustable so that you can make it fit under the bottom of the chain. And then what happens is that as you spray, as you clean, and you uh, you use your brush in front or behind it. Then all of the crud will, will go into this little white. Anything extra will stay here in, in so that it's much more of a, uh, a cleaning maintenance without causing a lot of, let's say, unnecessary mess in the garage floor. Done that one before. <laughs> I've Hold done it a lot of times. Just it. that apparatus I just showed you, it would be applying it on the underside of the chain on the inside. Okay. Uh, so that... Well, you know, we we have some people think it doesn't matter, right? They spray it from the outside spinning. I spray from the inside spinning so that the oil can clean whatever, you know, like I said, the solvents. Or, if it's already clean, you don't really, you're not aiming to clean it. Right. But I spray, I oil it from the inside down so that whatever is there, if there is any dust or dirt or crud or sand, then at least I'm, I'm pressure uh, with the oil and, uh, and pressure is pushing it away from the O-ring, the sprocket, etc. cetera. It, it's pushing it out that you can use a rag or something. But uh, I agree that once you spray <clears throat> the sprocket and the pins and, and the O-rings, so that's the sides when you're applying it, I would also do the pins uh, or the plates on the outside either with a rag or the brush or just spraying it and then uh, wiping it afterwards because the idea is to keep rust and corrosion from forming on the plates and and the pins. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, I agree with you that you're lubing it. Well, one, you're lubing it so that it's supple and the chain is less, you know, no kinks, et cetera. But if you're going to store it, you, you want to make sure that you don't leave a surface for rust to form. I like right? that. Yeah. No, I'm so, with you 100%. So, I mean, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, I agree. Like, you know, you, you do it both sides, and then they're like, well, that's not oiling anything. Well, yeah, it is. You know, you're oiling the plates because the plates rust too. And that maybe that doesn't change the performance, but it does change the appearance. <laughs> right, right. And looking good is almost as important as going fast, right? Yeah, well, if you're going slow, it better look good. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying I should shine my bike up. <laughs> All right. Um, so when we put out the feeler for this show, uh, we kind of came up with people asking questions before we actually got things started here. Yeah. And we told people, hey, we're going to be doing a giveaway with Motul. And uh, Motul actually came up with some products for us to give out. So producer Matt, if you can bring those up on the screen for us. Um, so here we are taking a look at these. Um, so basically these five people submitted their questions beforehand over the last week. We selected them and you're going to get some of these items sent out to you for sending these in. Uh, one of these is the Motul windbreaker. Um, you're going to get a keychain. You're going to get a Motul water bottle and a backpack as well. And these are all stuff that's uh, from Dakar, from the Paris Dakar rally. And these are going to go out to these next five people that we, uh, that submitted their questions. So we're going to go over these right now and uh, we'll be in touch to get your guys shipping information so that we can get these items sent out to you. Cool. <sighs> All right. Question number one. This is from Keith and his question is, I've lived in California most of my life and now reside in Eastern Washington state uh, where he lives in Washington has temperature extremes with hot summers, wet falls, very cold winters. Is there a difference in chain lube requirements for a more rainy area versus a drier one? 
And he doesn't preface what kind of bike he's riding, but uh, what are your thoughts on high desert versus cold, rainy winters and chain lube? On road or off road? Uh, we should flip a quarter because it doesn't say. <laughs> okay. to flip okay. one or you got it. So, like I said, if he's riding in the rain and in the mud and the gook, uh, the, the chain lube off road is is going to have to be reapplied much more frequently because the tactifier is very, very light. Uh, if he's going to be on the road like we, uh, we, did, we answered a minute ago, I, I still would either use the racing because it's in between. Right. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's not going to hold the sand as much or dirt or rocks as if he's, if he's off-road doing a trial or trails or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he's on the road, then because wet, like we, we described, that the, the water uh, will have a harder time to get in under the O-rings with a, uh, a heavier tactifier and, and thicker chain lube. All right. Makes sense. And what if he's an off-road guy? Um, I would use, well, I would still use off-road or the racing, uh, uh, the racing chain loop, the factory okay. line. Makes sense. All right. And now question number two. Uh, this one was sent in by Qu Craig, and his, his uh, question is just, hey, Dave. What motivates and inspires you? You can take that any way you want it. It can be personal life. It can be as a Motul guy or whatever. Just what motivates and inspires you? Oh, my. Um, you know, I, uh, after all these years, um, I, I like sharing. I, I kind of say, like, I'd, I'd like to share the knowledge that I have. I'd like to share the knowledge that I have uh, before I forget the knowledge that I learned. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to be that guy who said, gee, I forgot more than I, than I, I ever taught. So I, it motivates me. So now I actually do in the Northwest, uh, I'm doing, well, uh, I'm doing that area to train reps and to train dealers. But we're also, because of this, this quarantine stuff, uh, I'm sending feelers out to the reps uh, where we actually do webinars on the advantages of an ester base, advantages of an engine oil, advantages of minerals, uh, you know, like a training webinar. Uh, and we try to get consumers and we try to get dealers because if we're all locked at home, well, a lot of us are locked at home, um, then I can pass it. So what uh, motivation wise is I like to train and I really like when, when the light bulb goes off in somebody's head, you can see in their face like, I understand this, and yeah. uh, that, that's a big motivation. It's funny is that uh, I have this little toy behind me, and, and it's a syringe. And can you see that? Is that, is that? Uh, a little bit? No. How about now? <laughs> what are we injecting? Well, so so if you, oops. Oh God, Christina's all wet now. <laughs> um, so if you, you take physics, right? This syringe is full of water. You know, squeeze all you want. You can't compress this liquid. Now, slightly compressible, but you see, you can't compress it. And so a lot of people are asking about brake fluid. So why do we sell three different, four different types of brake fluid? We have 5.1, we have RBF 600, we have RBF 660. We have, in the Europe, we have another racing one that goes to 700. And says, so why, why do we need such a high boiling point? And I just use this simple $2 syringe, and I'm like, well... When you go out to ride, everything is perfect, and you squeeze your lever, and it moves the fluid. Life is grand. But if you start to boil it, in other words, if the fluid boils in the caliper, and I, you can see you start putting gas inside, which is when you boil water, you get bubbles. When you boil brake fluid, you get gas bubbles. And with physics, you can compress air. So right. all of a sudden, this is your handlebars, right? It's Going straight. I mean, this and is your lever. Done that. Not not fun. Right. So I just use this syringe, for instance, and say, "Hey, this is how how hydraulics work." Here is a demo of you cooking your brake fluid, and now you're going to hit the tree. You're going to do the George of the Jungle thing and smack your head. So then you either wait till it cools, 
when the bubbles go back to a fluid. Or you have to stop somewhere and you have to get the liquid back full and you get rid of the air so that your brakes work again. Right. This is kind of what gets me uh, uh, motivated to pass on why we do what we do and then and, and have people understand it in very simple terms. I mean, this is really as simple as it gets. <laughs> No, it's it's really cool because like I enjoy talking to you. I talk to so many different people, not just necessarily in our industry, but throughout different walks of life, business owners, people that work counters. And there's some people that hate what they do or they're just not into it. So talking to you, I can feel your enthusiasm about the mm. products you work with every day. And it's it's really neat. So um, it's, it's neat to hear that you like developing new products and working with stuff and helping other people learn to love it and understand what it does. Oh, yeah. I mean, so that's, uh, that's yeah. Motul right there. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so let's go ahead, jump into our next question, number three. And this one is actually a 3A and a 3B. So um, let's go with 3A first, then we'll pull 3B out after that. So this is from Matthew C. And Matthew's first part of his question, are different chain loops required for different uh, chains, like an O-ring versus an X-ring versus a standard chain? Or can you use the same type of chain lube on all different types of chains? Um, X-ring, O-ring, Z-rings, um, the chain lubes, uh, all, all of them will work because mm -hmm. we, we designed them to go with uh, L-rings, X-rings, Z-rings. Right. Application-wise, um, yeah, it makes a difference. That's why we make five. Uh, it's because, five. I mean, or four. You can put three other cans out there and we'll call it seven. <laughs> yeah, there, there we go. So, Depends on what you're counting. Um, yeah, but... but it, it, it's not that the Z rings, X rings, and but the additive package, by the way, has extreme pressure additives and friction modifiers. So if you have a chain, old school, mm -hmm. um, where there's no O rings whatsoever, right? Then uh, you want the extreme pressure additives. You want the, uh, the the higher level of tack to stay in the pins while while you're running. Mm -hmm. um, the old days, there's there's different types of tactifiers, right? So the old days we used to uh, steal an uh, old pot that mom had and you would melt down uh, wax and oil. Steel and pots, right? Like from the kitchen? Yes. You know, okay. hey mom, I need to borrow this. And then you would throw your non-O-ring kind of stretched out a bit chain because you didn't mm -hmm. have money for chains every, I don't know, five years, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and you would uh, melt the paraffins, the wax, you would melt the, uh, the grease, you'd add, you know, SDP in there for some, some sticky, tacky stuff, and then you'd boil your chain, right? Really? And then you'd hang it outside and let it drip dry, and the waxes would, would solidify, and that's old school, right? That's how you got your chain prepped for your weekend, is because it didn't have O-rings to protect the grease and oils from coming out of the pins. Gotcha. All right. And let's jump back to question number three, part 3B. Let's see what that one was. And then this was just asking about um, our different chain lubes for different types of racing, such as supercross, motocross, desert, and if so, what the difference is. So I think that one kind of comes down to speed, which we already answered a little bit. But if you want to go into a quick reiteration of that one that'd be kind of neat so yeah, different I mean, on chain loop well, types you know, like, like supercross and, uh supercross motocross depending on the track uh supercross uh is not i mean there are sometimes you have sand sand pits or whatever daytona but, action or something yeah but then you know you have to be you have to be careful that you know if you bottoms out and it gets it packed full of sand i wouldn't use the chain lube road mm -hmm. um and it's a relatively short race so i would say the chain lube off road for for motor uh, for supercross is fine because well, how long are you out there you know yeah 30 minutes plus two so, laps <laughs> yeah so if you spray the chain down the whole object uh with the off-road 
is the least amount of friction is the best for power, and, and the least amount of friction is the chain loop off-road. So if it's a half an hour race in a controlled condition with really nice dirt, you know, I would just use the, the chain loop off-road for that type of racing because it's short and you don't want to drag it anywhere. You don't want to drag it down. You don't want to right, cause right. horsepower yeah, loss. Power. Yeah. Um, with a chain loop road, it's more street, uh, it's more standard, it's more, you know, you can ride a thousand miles on your bike if you're doing a tour. Mm -hmm. You're never doing a thousand miles on a supercross bike. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the way you ride. No, yeah. I'm just <laughs> All right. Um, and then I got kind of another thing going on in the comments over here on YouTube. One guy said, hey, do I ever have to lube my O-ring or X-ring chain? And someone else said, no, it's internally lubricated, so... Yes, but that, that, that's fine for internally if the O-ring stays supple. If the O-rings crack, then well, that statement's out the window. Right. So, yeah, it's internally, internally lubricated until the outer plates and pins are rusty and cutting up the O-ring. So, yeah, you have to lubricate it to keep corrosion, rust, and crud from slicing up the O-rings. All right, so we're not just doing it to lubricate the, the chain and everything. We're putting that chain lube on there to condition the O-rings and keep them supple, soft, and prevent the cracking and tearing, right? Exactly. Otherwise, when you get your chain hot and they're all cracked, where do you think that internal grease is going? Centrifugal force oh, is sending it out the window. All right. Boom. Good information there. All right, let's jump over to question number four. And this one was sent in by Kendall R. And uh, this one's not so much a chain lube question as just a or a general oil motor oil question. And his question is, uh, what is the benefit of synthetic over conventional oil? <laughs> oh man, I think we just opened a can of worms on this one. Ah, it's all right. I was preparing for that. I knew somebody right. would throw me a wrench. Grab a so, drink, guys. We're going to be here for an hour on this well, one. No, no. I actually made some demos to make it a little <laughs> easier to understand. So, all right. Okay, I put I put these t together, right? And for mineral for mineral oil, life is grand. But well, it's running. Life is good. This is this is a mineral based product. All sorts of different sizes, different shapes, different forms. But while it's running, it's doing the job. It's lubricating. But as you see park the bike leave it sit for the the winter or something and all of the oil falls off on its own weight right all of it falls off okay and the reason that we use a group five ester base right if you look at any of our synthetic motor oils the synthetic the ester is a group five you can see that the molecules are all the same size they're all they're all uniform makes a much stronger type of molecule but as it runs, it does the same thing as a mineral oil, it's lubricating, it's doing the job. But as you can see, when you park it for six months, one year, depending on how many bikes you have and how often you want to ride it, the ester base has a, has a negative end chain and the ferrous metals have a positive. So the difference between the ester base synthetic and a mineral base is that even after a year of storage, the oil is attracted to the rings, the rods, the pins, uh, the bearing, and with the mineral base, after a year of time, only thing is uh, wherever you have little ledges, the oil can pool on. But mm -hmm. as far as being attracted to the ferrous metals, the ester are attracted sort of like a refrigerator magnet is attracted to the fridge. So They're mineral refrigerators. Yeah, so mineral and the ester-based synthetic. What would you rather run if you leave it sit for six months in the garage? I'd run that. Right. I didn't know that. I thought the synthetic was just uh, better for breaking down and lasting longer, but it actually bonds to the metal and stays lubricated while it's not being run as much. Well, there's five groups of oil. So the first group, group one and two are mineral. Group three, okay. four, and five are synthetic. Three is the least expensive, but it's a lot more development because of the masses. Then you have group four, which is a true synthetic because it's made in a lab and all the molecules same size. And then a group five is an ester base. And that group five is the only one that's attracted to ferrous metals. So you can have group three and four, which are synthetic, but they're not attracted to ferrous metal. Only a group five is. So you'll see in the power sports brands of oils, 
a few have this ester base, and this ester base is group five, top of the line, and that's what makes it much more expensive because it's okay. all made in the lamp. Our first, our first ester base, by the way, was a coconut derivative. You know? Really? Yes. I mean, if you ever cook coconut oil, right, you can get it bloody hot before it starts to break down. So Burns running to heat. Awesome. Yeah. So running to heat was great. Yeah. Um, it, carbon footprint was less. And the, when, when we got to 12 million gallons a year of, of ester based for our racing stuff, mm -hmm. we kind of ran into a problem of supply. It's kind of like there's not enough coconuts to make to make our ester base, so we had to start to uh, go, you know, change formulas to uh, catch up with uh, technology and demand. So right now, our our racing 300V ester core, if we're talking about synthetics, has uh -huh. uses four different Group Five synthetics okay. to make up the formula. And I hope that answers his question. <laughs> I think it does. I'm not talking to the guy, but I'm pretty sure that covers his thing. So um, that's going to take us into question number five here, which I believe is kind of going off that one a little bit more. And this question was put together by uh, Patrick K. And Patrick's question is, uh, for a high-performance engine, let's agree that full synthetic oil is more durable solution lifespan for the oil. Never mind that part. Um, from this point, why is Motul better than a similar product from a competitor? So basically – Synthetic versus synthetic from your company to someone else out there, what makes Motul a better oil? Wow. Good question. Let's right? take so, a bit. So, so I, that's why I made this demo, right? I mean, mm -hmm. made that in my, on my patio. It's, it's kind of cool stuff. And then Yoshimura helped with the brackets and stuff. So, and then the difference is which type of ester are you using? There, there are... 10,000 different types of ester type of uh, oils. Uh, for air conditioning, for instance, in, in California, you must use an ester base. Uh, jets at the airport, there is not a single jet that doesn't use an ester base synthetic. That's a group five. Um, we needed, after years, you know, it's years, decades, that you find the esters that work with fuel dilution, constant heat cycling. Then you have to look like deposits. Does it leave a uh, coking deposit? Will it work with gasoline? Will it work with ethanol? Will it work with methanol? Will it work with um, uh, different sulfur levels of fuel? I mean, so when you, when you develop a, a, an oil for an internal combustion engine, we ended up using four different group fives that handle uh, let's say seals and gaskets, and then you have uh, alcohols that you have to deal with, then you have phase separation you have to deal with. And so you have to find the right ester bases and you have to stay on top of it. Hence, we sponsor uh, the yeah, we take care of MotoGP, we sponsor World Superbike, we did Moto America. Um, and we use all of this to to develop new products. And so, uh, how we differ is the ingredients. Um, we actually don't even buy uh, additives any longer from what's available at like Lubrizol or Ornite or the, these people who supply additives. We have our own 20, 20 years of research and development to make sure that we can reduce the friction enough, but we get a JSO MA2, which is uh, the measurement of grip on your clutch plates. So w we need to make sure that the oils can deal with the resins and glue that actually make up the clutch plate. And then it can bring, uh, shall we say, that it doesn't have the friction modification, doesn't mess up the wet clutch ops so we have two lines we have a car line of our ester base synthetic and we have a power sport line because the car line is full of friction modifiers which would make our clutch in power sport slip that makes sense perfectly 
All right. Um, so that's going to wrap up our five questions that were submitted by the guys. Uh, maybe if we can pop up those uh, Motul products again, we're going to be giving away the jacket, backpack, stuff like that, that Motul donated for us. So once again, those five people that don't, are submitted those questions ahead of time, thank you very much. You guys will be receiving these. And then um, there's one other question I do want to bring up that was submitted through uh, YouTube from TK Moto. And his, it's kind of a two-part question. The first one he asked was, how do they affect clutch in, or affect a wet clutch in a motorcycle, referring to synthetics? The second part of the question was, when using a synthetic with, uh, say, a recluse clutch, it's something they usually don't recommend. Um, what are your thoughts on a synthetic versus a non-synthetic oil for, for a clutch, for a wet clutch? So, uh, let's say uh, some time back in the past, uh, Many years ago. Well, not that many, but they, they, everybody would be buying car oil right off the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then they had energy EC2, right? We had energy conserving too. It gave you 2.7% better mileage, blah, blah, blah. But it would also decrease the clutch of 15% because of the fact that it was so slippery. And then... Uh, Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki, Kawasaki, I mean, they all got together and they created this Japanese Automotive Standards Organization, right, JSO. Mm -hmm. And if you look on modern day power sport bottles, you're going to see JSO MA, or you're going to see JSO MA2, or you're going to see JSO MB, right? And these are, uh, are, are standards or uh, ratings that the factories now uh, are putting or requesting that you pass these tests and this is to make sure that the clutch isn't adversely affected. So first thing is that synthetics don't make a clutch slip. It's the additive package. Right? Okay. So base oil of synthetic and base oil of mineral. Friction coefficients are pretty close. It's what mm -hmm. you put in them, you know, like the fat on a steak would, would cause a pretty pretty slippery situation um flavor and yeah yeah so to go over really i mean to, to explain it really quick mm -hmm. this jso ma2 and our our synthetics our, our 5100 semi-synthetic our uh 7100 100 synthetic uh recreational street product our 300v these do uh, a series of tests that the JSO requires. And I, I can explain it in, in, in one minute by saying that the first test that they're going to do is a, is a timed test. And it's saying that you have a clutch, you know, the clutch has plates like this. Right. And there's your pressure plate, right? Your finger, finger top finger is your pressure plate. Okay. So it's saying that the clutch is open, right? And then it's saying how long does it take if they dump the clutch to lock up, right? If it takes too long to lock up, it's too slippery. It don't pass. If right. it locks up within a certain amount of time, right, then our clutch is is perfect. And then you pass the first test, which is a timed test. Uh, the second test is more of a torque test. So you've got a fully locked up clutch. How much torque does it take to break the clutch free? If it breaks free too soon, well, the oil's too slippery. It don't pass. Right. And then the third test is, again, a time test. It's like, okay, you got a fully engaged clutch. Now you're going to shift. So you open, close. How long does it take to fully open and fully close and lock back up? If it takes too long to lock back up, <laughs> it's too slippery. You don't pass. So the, the, the stickiest rating is MA2. If you pass MA2, it means that your clutch is the stickiest formula or the oil has passed the most stringent wet clutch tests. If you get an MA, it could be a little slippery like a racing product, an mm -hmm. MA1 or MA. And then you have a JSO MB. An MB would be these energy conserving two oils or these, these oils that cars are using to give you 5, 10, 20% more uh, mileage. But the trouble is that your wet clutch is out the door. It's, it's going to fail. It's going to glaze. So uh, we have MA2 for full-on uh, street synthetics. And we have MA for the 300V series, which is, uh, shall we say, closer to an MA1. 
because, well, it's a racing product. We, we, we want power. Gotcha. <laughs> does, that, so basically, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, just basically. So it's not saying you can't use a synthetic with certain types of clutches. It just depends on what type of synthetic and how much right. uh, slip it has to it. Yes, if you're going to use some some cheap, off-the-wall car oil that's made to give you better mileage, you, you're going to screw up your clutch. Yeah. And then as far as recluse is concerned, th these guys are wonderful because – We've been working. We've been working side by side for years. Uh, mm -hmm. We sponsored Jared Meads, and he won the title on a flat track uh, uh, with a recluse clutch. And we sponsor a road race, and we sponsor um, off-road guys. And, Very and cool. they they recommend our oil because well, we make sure that their products work <laughs> <laughs> as well as their products uh, like to use our stuff. Definitely goes hand in hand. Oh yes. Um, and then there's one more question that actually came up in the comments right here from uh, John Van Holt. And Motul USA has actually already answered it in the comments, but I want to bring it up as well. Um, yep. I've been riding a KTM 300 two-stroke with a carburetor for a long time. It's been fantastic. And I just purchased a new TPI, which is the transfer port injected bike, and it has the oil injection system on it. Um, so that requires a special type of oil. It's a little bit thinner for premix. Right. And uh, I was under the impression Motul did not have anything that worked with that. But uh, you guys are answering that the Motul 800 uh, two-stroke oil does work with that. So uh, yeah. maybe. No, uh, if, if you're going to use an injector system, I would use the 710. Okay. And it's a JSO FD. You can, if you use the 802T, it needs to be pretty warm outside. Okay. But... Uh, I would say that 710 2T is uh, the highest performance, 100% synthetic ester-based product that we have for an oil tank. Okay. And I don't know if, if they explained, uh, but the difference between a, uh, a uh, premix oil and an injector premix oil mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is a big difference, actually. Uh, if I use this can, I'll just say that a racing 802T is, is this much oil and some additives, right? Makes sense. Okay. Um, if, you, uh, if you're looking at an injector premix, let's say this much is oil. Then you have white spirits. I mean, we use gasoline, but gasoline explodes, so maybe white spirit's a little safer for us, right, uh, to make it thinner. And then we use a PIB, polyisobutane. This, this, is, this is a product for anti-smoke, right? So if you just take a Zippo lighter and you light it, you get yellow and blue flames and put your hand over it, you get this black soot. If you take a big lighter that's all butane, uh, you light it, you get a blue flame, and you have no smoke. So mm -hmm. this PIB is to prevent smoke. That's it. It doesn't help lubrication at all. It's just, can you imagine, in Spain, they have three million scooters in the city. Like they, they were all two strokes. So they all have to use this anti-smoke. And then mm -hmm. you have additives. So you have oil, white spirits, PIBs, additives. So one ounce of 802T has more oil than one ounce of the 710 because the 710 has all of these other ingredients inside. Okay. So to answer the question, the 710 is going to be good to use with the uh, oil injected bikes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. 802T is more premix. Like I said, if it's very hot outside and you're in Arizona, the 802T will flow through. I mean, but you got to remember those little teeny. It's tiny. The, the tiny, tiny hoses. So mm -hmm. it, if you if it's cool outside and you use 802T, it's more like going to McDonald's and taking a shake right out of the machine and stuck a straw in it and trying to suck it up. Not that I've ever done that. <laughs> Okay, you, you, you will turn blue before you get the, before you get it up the straw. <laughs> Too thick. Right. Um, what else? What else? What else here? Um, that's pretty much it. Do you have anything else you want to add for the day? Um, no, I think we covered all sorts of goodies. Um, I <laughs> would say that uh, what people don't don't know of our history, you know, it's right above my head. Um, besides the company starting in 1853 in New York, it was owned in the 19, early 1900s by J.D. Rockefeller. So it was owned by Standard Oil. 
1911, the government said, okay, Standard Oil, you, you, your monopoly is too strong, so it broke it up. And Swan and Finch, which owned the brand name Motul, became an independent company. So in that time, in that period, uh, in 1953, Motul created the first semi, uh, sorry, the first multi-grade oil. Um, and in France, uh, the company uh, that's, uh, that the family that bought uh, Motul, mm -hmm. and it took it to Europe in 1932, uh, still own the company today. This is a family-owned really? uh, business. It's not, you know, on some stock market exchange. This is all family, all 800 people around the world that have an email address. And, and this is how we can get things very specially made that aren't, maybe they're not the best profit center. But you must have the right stuff for the right application, even if it's limited. And... And interesting enough is that in 1966, you know, we had the first semi-synthetic oil, which, you know, we have another brands that say, oh, we were the first in synthetics in 1971. It's like, dude, you're way off. Uh, <laughs> in 1971, we actually had the first fully synthetic uh, based on esters in 1971. So we have been messing around with esters longer than any other company in the world. That's phenomenal. So, so the, uh, in 2011, uh, we went to this Estra core, and that Estra core, like I said, is four different group fives. The, the, we found the best out of each that, that help us develop different things, working with uh, racing and working with street, you know, heat cycling, et cetera. Water that comes out the steam actually is acidic water, so now you need a lot of calcium for roll aids. You know, so you can kill the acids before they form. That uh, that's coming from these research. So, um, so that uh, that gives a little more history on on uh, the Motul background. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, for the people that are watching that maybe do want to get their hands on one of those uh, Dakar kits that come with the water bottle, comes with the jacket, the backpack, and the keychain. Uh, we actually have a limited supply of these at Bike Bandit, and we're going to be giving them, giving them away to some people that call in to purchase Motul products. Um, so once I, once again, guys, it is very, very limited. We don't have a lot of them, but if you call in and spend $100 before tax and uh, make a purchase of strictly Motul items over $100, and once again, guys, you have to call in to get this. It cannot be purchased through the website. Um, we'll be including this with your purchase, uh, those items that you saw right there. So um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today, watching our very first episode of Live Sessions here on Bike Bandit. I want to thank uh, Dave Woolman from Motul USA for joining us. And uh, thank you very much to the, everybody for watching. Yeah, it was great. All right, man. Well, you have yourself a great day. And uh, thank you once again. Take care. Yeah, anytime. Let's do a second one on oils. I like it. We'll do that for sure. <laughs> Great. Bye.